Essilor South Asia. Dr. Vivek Mendonza, he's a director for the Lawrence and Mayo Group. Dr. S. Vishwanathan, he's uh, head of department for the optometry department at Shankar Netralia. Mr. Kunal Shah, he's going to join us uh, shortly. Uh, he runs his own practice uh, called Eye Savers. And Dr. Sandeep Bhutan, who's a global technical lead Asia for uh, Sight Savers. So what I'll do is I won't take much time, but I will, um, you know, uh, kick off by getting the first uh, panelist to speak. The first one would be Dr. Uh, Krishna Kumar. Once he finishes, um, then um, Dr. Monica would speak and then we'll just go on. So I might just come in and prompt people to just start. And then uh, with the participants, uh, I'm, um, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just requesting you to one, uh, make sure your video is turned off. So Nandini, if you can turn everybody else's video off, that would be good. Uh, then also please uh, type in a question on the chat box and we'll make sure at the end, I will put together um, you know, enough questions for the panelists. So can we start off with um, the opening comments, um, Dr. Krishna Kumar? You're, you're on mute, uh, KK, I'll, I'll make sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Vinod, and uh, thank you, IBA, for uh, organizing this uh, panel discussion. And um, it will be more appropriate for me to talk more on academia and how we are to cope up with the existing COVID scenario, not only in India, but throughout the world. And um, this, this uh, is actually disrupting, this COVID-19 is really disrupting um, the students' life, faculty members' life, and uh, more so the institutional uh, no, uh, uh, plannings as well as uh, the finance situation. Um, interestingly, the Indian scenario has got uh, more of 75 25 um, challenge. Those, uh, I, I'll just uh, give you, there are two kinds of um, universities or the institution, whether you take optometry or any kind of education system in this country. That university or the educational system wherein they have had had uh, experience of dealing with the virtual learning are the one who is trying to venture into and trying to see whether they could overcome this no problem of COVID. The other institutions, especially when they are in the remote places, they are overcoming the challenge of how, how to introduce this especially with the infrastructure disability they do have. The other side of the challenge which we are going through is, interestingly, I thought I will introduce with a recent study, I think just day before yesterday, the Spain group under the Erasmus Fund has come out with a very nice publication, which probably will be the first step to all of us to really look into it. So the study is all about during the COVID-19 confinement, especially for students, the initiatives which has been taken by various institutions throughout the world, especially on teaching and assessment aspect. I've been looked into that study and the first and foremost, of course, it didn't go through the peer review. It is more fresh paper, which has been got published but I think it will go to the peer review later. It's a, a unique uh, thing in publication world. But the paper was well written. It is from Spain, Madrid. The first question they were asking whether the new, whether the students in the confinement, whether they are performing well, that instead of getting into fine details, it says, yes, it gone into the, the performance have improved. If so, whether this performance is because of the learning strategies or the assessment technique, uh, they did compare, the study was well done, it was compared with the previous years also. And it says more than learning technique, more than in, from the point of view of the faculty or the assessment technique, it is because of the, they use the word autonomous or we can use the self-learning ability at this crisis situation 
which can be accounted to various things. It might be a new beginning, so students got interested, or it can be because they have the fear or they have adequate time, maybe anything of that kind. And they say it is because of the self-learning self-learning strategies which students themselves have created probably is the reason for better performance. And they say the grades also have improved com compared to the thing. When we looked into our own experience in optometry where we were in a position, especially in our institution, we were in a position of completing um, almost 85% of the uh, portions. We have completed now everything. And we are in a position to conduct uh, some of the assessment we call continuous in, uh, norm uh, assessment, third component, and we are into whether we need to conduct the final through any of these methods. Now, this method uh, so far, we found that the performance has actually improved. When we looked into the feedback from the students, they said they are comfortable. Of course, the biggest challenge we have is we don't have any method to clarify whether they have the cheating or they are cheating or not. Of course, it's all time, but still the challenges is there. So what, what I feel is this is the big uh, challenge we are uh, waiting for. There are a lot of information so given in my next round, I will be talking about what are the initiatives UGC has taken, what are the recommendations we have taken, and overall from optometry, how we have to learn. Thank you, Ravich. Thank you very much, KK, and thanks for making it short and very, very relevant. So, Monica, do you want to just uh, continue again uh, from the academics perspective? Yeah, uh, thank you, Krishan Kumar, for telling in some of the things. But as a university, a uh, few challenges that I would like to bring in now. Of course, as uh, Dr. Krishan Kumar just said, it is a big challenging time. Suddenly one fine day, we all announced that we all have to be locked down, sit at the home. And at the same time, till date, we do not have directives from UGC. When do we get the students back? The COVID has not ended up and they cannot, the whole essence of a university or a school is gathering. And by any chance, they cannot risk it till they are sure they can let people come back. So it is a possibility August or September when the student gathering will come back. The whole semester had to be taught. So everybody went online. And one fine day we handed over these online platforms to our faculty and to our students. So the challenge was both had to learn. The good side was they both learned. So there we see the whole blast of webinars happening and we learned a new era of things. This will bring in a positive change. This is what I see the future will now come into. That we will now in optometry also bring in online education, especially the continuous education. The continuing education for a person who's graduated, working at a place to come in and lies and have certifications like this. But what is missing as Dr. Krishna Kumar said is the practical hand on self-guided learning, assignments, uploading things, teaching these webinars, they are making an impact. We see almost 100% attendance, which we do not see in a regular classroom mode. But what is missing out is the hands-on. We are all skill-based professions. We can teach in a course of pharmacology or community optometry, but unless we bring them together on a hands-on session, we cannot complete our things. So this is the, the kind of a blended learning pattern which has to be brought in. The other scenario where we see is hospitals are not going to come in so soon. It is not going to be easy to bring back the students into the practical training of hospitals. The whole format of working at the hospital will change. We will limit ourselves and every time now we are learning the remote methods of eye examinations, we'll have to restrict our slit lamp examination. We'll have to ensure that our students and everybody is not exposed and we don't go so close to each other. Another scenario is the optometry students are majorly been involved in community activities. They are the ones who go into the camps and learn and outreach. 
Now, I don't think outreach is going to happen for quite some time. The community activities are not going to come in so easy. So there is going to be a period of teaching where all this will be missed out. Our hospital partnerships, how do they take in to bring in these students also for treating? So yes, we had the good things of learning online, like sitting now today. I'm learning with this team of these panelists here. And we have a lot more of these webinars which have been flashed and we can even have speakers from across the globe to come in and bring in that value and do not waste our time on transport. But we have yet to formulate into the system of our education. How do I now conduct the exams? I have to end, end up the semester. Do I do an online test <clears throat> and just finish off the semester? The challenge is also bringing new admissions, the whole semester beginning. So there is a lot of uh, question mark that is right now for us. Change is going to come in. We will have to flow with the system. I see a lot of change in the education pattern. However, we cannot excuse ourselves from physical training. We have to see how hospitals will accept as trainees, as COVID settles down, things will come in. But if it doesn't settle down soon, it's a lot more for us to worry then. Over to you, Vinod. Thank, thank you so much, Monica. And I know, Monica, you won't be able to stay for the discussion, but thanks for taking the time and sharing your thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you. So just be around till till our time. I am I am around till I join in there. I am around here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now can I just move on to to Ram? I think Ram, you've been with the corporate sector for a long time. So you know, from the corporate sector perspective, if you could share your thoughts. I think Ram needs to be unmuted. So good morning to all and uh, it's a pleasure to catch up with people. Uh, of course, uh, I would have preferred catching up with non-COVID situation, but I guess uh, this is the best way to do it. And so I think uh, uh, we have made the best use of a situation which today uh, has hit all of us. So I will be specific to the optical sector and maybe I'll touch a bit on the, on the macro factors. But uh, the optical sector, if you look at the optical retail, is going through a tough time all across. In the sense, in India, you have organized retail and also independent retail, and we have hospital-associated uh, retails as well. And all of them, this is the first time I see that everyone is hit across in the same fashion as never before. The Probably the reason is pre-COVID, I think we already had issues in the industry because of the uh, influx of uh, the online uh, business, which actually was done in order, the business was not on a level playing field and uh, they were actually doing business on acquiring consumers. In that bargain, they were losing money, but the investors were putting in money. And uh, in the end, the whole game was to see, to get a threshold of consumers and by which they would get the size and then probably the profitability. So as on date, no online company in India in opticals are showing profits. So, and they have accumulated losses, quite significant accumulated losses. So that has also hit the industry a lot in the last two, three years. And, uh, and added to that, the COVID has come in. So that's something which uh, uh, we need to take uh, uh, issue of. Now, as we go along post-COVID, I, what I see it is that uh, the, uh, it's not going to be a cakewalk now for next two quarters, it's going to be a slow process. But in the bargain also, there is some flip side to it because out of the 739 districts in India, 300 districts today is COVID free, according to the government. So we need to target these kind of districts to see whether we can accelerate eye care in a faster way till such time the other districts come into, uh, into picture. And uh, also I think there's a lot of stimulus which is required for the industry today because the rentals and the salaries are the biggest component of the MSME. And uh, that's something which people need to look at. And the government, uh, there's a request already given by the association uh, in order to re request for a stimulus for the industry, which is uh, today hovering around uh, between 12 to 15,000 crores. We are not a very big industry, eye care industry in the optical sector compared to the rest of the 
uh, world, but uh, rest of the world as well as rest of the other industries in India. But it's been growing at around 5% uh, uh, year on year for the last many, many years. But uh, now this is going to be a challenge where we need to get the support of the government and the stimulus is very much required in order to make sure the salaries are paid Normally, typically in a business, 20, you have a 20 to 30 days of cash flow in your business as uh, to sustain. So that's how it was sustained for about a month. So now people are going to face that. But I guess we will have to uh, live with this for a while and see how we can come over it. And uh, last but not the least, I think there's a huge opportunity now for Make in India because 95% of our products are imported and mostly coming from China. And uh, so if you're able to get Make in India happening in India for opticals, I think allied industries as well as the large and uh, FDIs can come in, the large and uh, MSMEs can invest. I think it's going to be a win-win for the country. So opportunity there in these kind of uh, difficult circumstances as well. Over to you, Vinod. Yeah, thank you so much, Ram. Um, now, before I pass it on to Vivek, can I ask the audiences, please type in your question. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of table them at the end once all the panelists speak. But in your question, please mention your name and any institutional uh, affiliation. Uh, over to you, Vivek. Yes. Good morning, uh, participants and esteemed panelists. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Vivek uh, Gerard Mendonca. So my experience over the last 28 years is in starting schools of optometry, uh, we put up the first degree college of optometry in Maharashtra, Bharti Vidya Pet, And uh, I have been involved in promoting optometry to a uh, lot of science colleges across the country. Uh, today, we, uh, at a peak time, we were graduating more than 3,500 optometrists uh, per year. I'm also a director of the Lawrence Mayo Group with my fellow directors and team members and a trustee at the Association of Schools and Colleges of Optometry. So I have got just three points to make. Uh, one is teleoptometry is going to definitely boom. It's going to break down the borders and barriers which we had with rural India. Teleophthalmology was already at a good peak, but it's going to definitely take a, a inflicting point and go upwards. And the uh, use of self-assessment of eye tests, using your mobile phone to self-assess your eye, eye uh, do a, uh, your own eye test use your camera phone and to upload that data to subject matter specialists who can then further guide you what needs to be done. I see this is uh, going to be the way of life and we are not going to see any change for the next uh, three years. We will have to get to uh, used to these new uh, ways of life and the new ways of doing business. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Vivek. Um, now, just moving on. You know, from a hospital perspective, could I invite Dr. Vishwanathan to, to just make your opening comments? I think Vishwanathan, you're on mute, so we'll just, you just need. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Vinod. And uh, I would be uh, covering uh, most of the, uh, you know, protocols that are to be um, followed prior to, during and after patient care. And uh, first and foremost thing, we will have to make sure that staff are symptom free each day. And some of the recommended uh, precautions are staff to use private vehicles and to avoid uh, public transport, to wear a mask during travel, and all the employees to undergo screening every day with thermal screener upon entering. And if any of the employees have fever, cough, or any of the symptoms, they should be asked to go home and seek medical advice from his or uh, her physician. And during the patient care, optometrists to use uh, surgical scrubs or proper PPEs in the designated room and to restrict one attendant per uh, patient and preferably space out the chairs so that we could follow the social distancing outside as well as inside the clinic. History taking to be done over phone, uh, preferably when we schedule the appointments, some of the basic history like, you know, symptoms, if there are any COVID symptoms, better to defer the consultation. And if it is a non-emergency case, again, we could defer the consultation. And uh, after taking history, and when we call the patient in, better to greet them with namaste and no handshakes, and instruct patients to use hand sanitizers upon entering. 
And when we use instruments like lensometer, it is better to be cleaned with 70% isopropyl alcohol. And uh, when uh, performing objective refraction, autorefractive is preferred over uh, retinoscopy. And when we use trit lamp, again, better to use breath shields and disinfect with isopropyl alcohol. And uh, applination tonometer only in indicated cases and to disinfect uh, the prism head immediately after every use. And differ contact procedures like gonioscopy or shimmers. And the ideal time for the consultation is 15 minutes or lesser. And as uh, Dr. Uh, Vivek said, it is better to consider remote care options for patients like teleconsultation or telecounseling. And it's time like these that, uh, you know, that we build our practice as caring for patients during difficult times will be remembered. Thanks, thanks, you know, go over to you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Vishwanathan. We'll just move on to um, Kunal Shah now. So Kunal runs his own optometry uh, practice. Uh, Kunal, I think um, I, you, you're there, but- uh, I'm I, there. Uh, somehow I'm not able to connect to the video. I don't know what is happening. Okay, so, so yeah. I think it says iPhone. So yeah. th that's okay. We can hear you. You can keep, um, uh, yeah, uh, go ahead and, and, and just share, yeah. Thank you, Vinod, and uh, good morning to each and everyone. Uh, see, in an independent private practice, the situation is uh, something very different from most of the hospital-based study. Uh, you have to first counsel your actually uh, your entire employee, your optometrist, to bring them in a positive frame of mind is the biggest challenge. So most of these people, they would have the bad experience in these days. And to get them into a positive frame of mind is very important for the growth. Then you have to make sure that your practice is ready with all the equipments. That means you have sufficient amount of sanitizer, your masks, face shields, gloves, all of them has to be in sufficient stock. You need to get a self declaration from all of your people. If they are having any kind of fever, dry cough, sneezing problem, breathing problem, they need to have a self declaration that they have to sign. And once that is done, you can actually venture out and tell to your patient that you are ready to work now and you are open for consultation. The message has to be very loud and clear on that. The second message that has to go to your patient is that you are clean and disinfected. Your premises are safe and they are sanitized. There can be a very clear message that is put outside that has to be put to your social media marketing that has to be put through emails. So most of these good practices would have a software and you just have to shot a message to your patient that not only you're ready, but yours is a disinfected zone and it is safe to actually venture into it. That would be the most important challenge for a practice today to get your patient back in. Then you also need to give a specific appointments to the most vulnerable of the society, like a senior citizen. You can have the first hour in the morning only for the senior citizens when your premises is completely disinfected because they are more prone to the COVID. And you need to make sure that you keep a specific slot to them. This way you can also enhance your practice. There are a lot of other situations where people just come for the take off a contact lens care products, solutions, or even the contact lenses. And most of these things you can actually deliver to your home. That way you can avoid people actually walking into your clinic, which is not absolutely required. The other way of looking at it is you can also keep all these stocks ready and the patient can just walk into your clinic and just collect them and move on. So you have majority of your time to the practice where people actually require the most. The next thing is to install teleophthalmology in your clinic. In that way, you can, majority of work, you can actually uh, do sitting at your place. So uh, this way you can actually enhance your practice. Or do you know? Thank you so much, Kunal. Um, Hello. More yes. so, I think, sorry, I think. Okay. Uh, we, Yeah, 
So let's move on to uh, the, the, the final um, panel speaker. Um, Sandeep, you know, from uh, an, an NGO perspective, a big NGO like, um, uh, like Site Savers, uh, where do you see, uh, you know, this taking you organizationally and in terms of what you do there? Uh, thanks, Vinod. Uh, I mean, lovely looking at getting so much uh, of information from this entire panel. Uh, I mean, all of this actually for an NGO uh, is part of a program or a purpose that we are here for, which is essentially trying to do our part in the avoidable blindness and refractive error uh, arena as such. So the first thing that uh, has disrupted is the connect between these uh, uh, the project or the purpose and the population that because of the whole uh, lockdown, that has been the biggest impact. Uh, most of the community-based interventions that some of you already had highlighted to uh, have been put to a hold because obviously safety of both the staff and the population is uh, the most uh, important thing at the moment. Uh, most of the implementing partners, so eye hospitals, uh, again, are have largely attenuated uh, services. So uh, that has impacted uh, it quite a lot. Uh, uh, communications uh, has taken a major a role in the whole uh, way uh, organizations work. So the first responses, uh, uh, there are multiple responses that organizations or larger NGOs have uh, kind of started looking at. The first one is how do we communicate to donors and foundations who are our uh, kind of supporters who've been supporting us for this work. The first one is trying to send out clear messaging, reassuring uh, them that the conditions, we are aware of the situation. We are working towards creating solutions we are, work, we are understanding the impact of what's happening uh, that's the first reassurance that needs to go the second one of course is realignment of uh, uh, of deliverables or realignment of the strategies that were designed as a part of regular programming how those need to be now adapted what activities uh, will need to be kind of attenuated or delayed for a, for a while and what are the ones that that can still happen some repurposing of resources uh, is happening definitely both our implementing partners as well as some of the donors are trying to see how can we repurpose some of the resources that we have, whether it is manpower or infrastructure or resources uh, to aligning with the COVID response that is happening. And of course, communicating clearly both internally to the staff uh, for them to understand uh, what's happening and how organization is acknowledging uh, the situation. And also to our senior board members as well as donor uh, communities to make them understand that uh, we're kind of aligning with the situation. Uh, aligning with the first responders or the government initiatives wherever they're happening. We work in very close collaboration with the district as well as state uh, authorities. So trying to align our resources or our implementation with them uh, has been a priority wherever uh, there is possibility of contributing uh, to the, whole, uh, the COVID response, whether in terms of uh, creating awareness uh, in terms of distribution of support, uh, that that kind of uh, has happened. But largely trying to keep our teams on ground safe, trying to make them uh, realize that uh, safety of both staff as well as communities is important, following all the uh, kind of uh, safety guidelines as has been lighted by a lot of you uh, has been there. Plus also trying to make sure that uh, the responders know that uh, the project is, are available. So as things evolve, uh, if there are uh, individuals who have uh, either taken services like a cataract surgery or a pair of glasses in the recent past, how do we make sure that uh, they have a channel of communication? Because physical communication is usually not possible. Our field workers are not able to go. Are there alternate ways of establishing that communication through uh, mobile phones or, or if there is a mechanism of connecting with the first responders on ground, making sure that they also have a clear message that if in this community you have patients through our project who have been taken care of. If they want to get back to us, there is a mechanism that our field staff can connect them without kind of compromising uh, the safety uh, and situation. Of course, uh, for the staff, as some of you also said, uh, keeping them on high morale is important. Even in these difficult times, they need to understand that the organizations, uh, large or small, whoever they are, they need to uh, have very clear messaging uh, to the staff on ground, making sure they realize that uh, for us, uh, safety of the staff is also of paramount importance, and we uh, need to communicate them updates as they uh, come across. And a lot of our staff may be in remote uh, communities, 
where they are not uh, in touch with the information that we are getting uh, both uh, kind of nationally and internationally how can we communicate that information and keep them in the loop so that they are at the same plane and are uh, preparing themselves or are kind of uh, uh, there and give them a channel of response if they want to reach back for any specific support the staff on the ground or at the peripheral level needs to have that open channel where they can communicate their worries their their needs uh, to senior members and we can respond accordingly so this is the kind of response that uh, that the ngos or larger organizations are creating uh, so that we get through uh, this phase and also are preparing ourselves for the next one uh, things that were talked about looking at technology looking at what are the other ways of communicating can we do activities like trainings and awareness through means which are safe uh, in this uh, uh, possibility and also uh, trying to keep ourselves aware of what's happening in the other areas of health because eye health is not isolated we need to look at uh, what's the other health community doing so trying to being in touch with the health uh, system in the local region is very important and that's something that we are trying to work on thank you not thank you so much sandeep and thank you to all the panelists for being short but packed with uh, information from your 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 perspective um i've got a few questions so what i might do is just you know kick off on those questions and then we'll um, we'll we'll see how much time we we can go till i mean we got another 20 minutes more um the first question is um with regard to the optical industry uh, are there any guidelines so i'm i'm aware uh, i think maybe kunal and ram can comment on this or anybody else that you're putting some guidelines together i guess in terms of 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 you know how an optical outlet needs to function you know etc etc could you you know maybe share a bit more on that so ram why don't you start off on that and then you're on mute ram uh it's a, it's an important uh, question because uh, i need i think we need to when we reboot ourselves we need to be prepared i think uh, uh, there are some few organizations like uh, uh, i think many of these uh, optometry associations and uh, other organizations related to optometry are working together to come up with a kind of a, a protocol for the optical stores i think which were ably contributed by even uh, uh, experts like Uh, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, K. K. and uh, Vishwanath and many others. You know, I'm just taking names uh, here from from the panel, and maybe even uh, uh, Professor Monica would have also contributed to that. I think I I, I guess it's more or less ready. I, it should be out, I uh, perhaps today or tomorrow, uh, so that we are prepared uh, with the protocols. It's uh, only a guidelines and. Uh, the and so that you know people are ready with uh, some basic uh, yeah, information uh, ram can i add to it yeah. yes yeah yeah uh, we know the just uh, quick uh, few points i would like to add here see some of the guidelines i think i did mention during the talk i don't mind repeating it like you know uh, uh, whatever i said about the social distancing or to avoid crowding and to sanitize hands and wear masks are the same as covered earlier Uh, some of the other points i would like to you know just highlight for example to showcase products you could probably showcase it in a uh, tray and not uh, you know allow patients to have access to the display counter like before and probably shortlist frames like you know up to five frames so that you know it is easy for you to disinfect earlier we used to just uh, replace the frame in the display counter immediately after every use now you can't do that you know why and what we suggest also we have prepared a sop and what we have suggested is the used frames or the pupillometers must be disinfected with a disinfectant mm -hmm. and when we take ipd measurements it is better to use face shields and uh, uh, you know immediately after uh, every use to disinfect and uh, it is when we uh, collect cash better to encourage the digital payments and to avoid hard copies like bills or order forms so these are some of the guidelines uh, you know that uh, are to be followed yeah, or you. You, you wanted to share, say something yeah go ahead I, i think i just gone through the the draft which was uh, sent to me by the association i just was created by some of the stalwarts um uh, representing oci oatn 
uh, ASCO and uh, it was very nicely written, though we understand it is the um, minuscule information is there, but it will be the first draft will be, you know, hopefully first version will be released by today or tomorrow. It has come out well, mainly focusing on uh, optical shops and the optometric clinic and what are the precautionary measures we have to take. I think they have ref gave a lot of references, which has been adopted by the uh, various associations all around the world, as well as um, AIOS uh, rep, you know, guideline and uh, Indian government's guidelines, ICMR guideline. There's well uh, concise uh, information is available. Probably it will be available in another, today or tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, uh, KK. And uh, now the next question is maybe I'll get uh, you know Sandeep and uh, Vishwanath for you to respond first. Um, vision screening camps. I, I guess a lot of organizations used to run a lot of camps. Now those camps are going to get affected. So what do you think is the way forward there? Maybe Sandeep, you want to go first and Vishwanath, you can add to it? Yeah, sure. Uh, I definitely agree that uh, the vision screening camps uh, will definitely get affected because uh, one, it definitely increases the whole risk of uh, populations getting infected, and two, uh, I mean, are, are we kind of uh, are we able to control the the whole measures as we're talking about in that? So maybe uh, an alternate way, and, and again, if if we look at the whole uh, way. Organizations like Sightseers, for example, have been looking at vision screening. We've always been saying that that anyway was never supposed to be a long-term uh, kind of strategy. Long-term strategies were to encourage people, more and more people, to start visiting fixed facilities like vision centers, like primary eye care units or whatever, so that we can maintain a, a proper kind of uh, barriers there. We can, uh, let's say, uh, create more standardized workflow environments. Uh, so it probably may encourage those things more often, and we because we know that in primary care units, whether they are vision centers or any kind of primary care unit, uh, ma managing the uh, the guidelines as you would be mentioning would be slightly more uh, viable in the whole in uh, compared to the kind of core community based project. So maybe we will encourage the more facility based screenings and and create more awareness around. Uh, the communities so that uh, they can then start approaching the facilities. And of course, for facilities, the guidelines that uh, the scientific community and the, uh, the groups are producing would need to be reinforced. So in the community settings, we are still able to apply them. They need to be realistic enough and still protective enough so that uh, in those volumes and those settings, they are applicable. But I think the facility-based primary care would need to start taking more primary role as compared to the community-based outreach, which was outreach screening camps. Vishnath, would you like to add anything to it? I think you're on mute. Yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, I fully agree with Sandeep that yes, vision screening will definitely get affected, but there are, uh, you know, uh, hospitals which, uh, you know, solely depend on the screening camps and uh, some of the cataract screening camps as well. So I think we will have to, you know, really come out with, uh, you know, strategies uh, where we could, uh, you know, create awareness as Sandeep said, and then uh, you know approach it in a different way and then encourage them to visit some of the nearest uh, vision centers to start with and then once things improve probably we could uh, you know devise a system where we could uh, be in touch with them either through tele facility or tele consultation to start with and then slowly improve from there Over. thank you thank you and the next uh, one i think there's a lot of students who are uh, who have joined this session and their first concern is jobs. How is this going to impact the job market within this sector? So I'll just leave it open-ended for who wants to comment. Uh, and, and maybe a few of you might want to comment because I, I guess there's a lot of concern uh, what's going to happen to the future of this sector, you know, especially from people who are just graduating. There's a lot of people who have just joined the workforce. They're also very worried. So uh, if I may uh, start, Vinod, uh, I, uh, I think there's nothing to worry for the, the students uh, who are just emerging now and they're going to start off because what is required, India is a growing sector. The eye care sector is growing and I think uh, it is going to grow for next 
couple of decades and so there's a need and there is a the reach is also an issue and there's a need also and so i think the, the issue is not that the issue is now going to be whether are you going to be focused towards the cities and tier 1 and tier 2 or would you like to go little stretch it down to make a career beyond this tier 2 tier 3 towns and then so there's a huge opportunity there to give you an example uh, the top three uh, the cities the metros or the tier 1 and tier 2 there are 10 for every 10000 population or 10 to 11000 population there's one optical store today so in this kind of an environment it's going to be highly competitive so which means that the business is not going to generate as much profits as one can expect from uh, but if you go beyond the tier 3 then there is going to be a huge opportunity for people if they want to do private practice uh, or if they want to start their own store or something like that or you want to be associated with hospitals or even uh, with uh, ngos and so on because it's not that ngos are not that there is a purpose and there is i think a lot of need for ngos to be also to be there in india so there's a future for everyone and i'm very optimistic about that thanks ram would anyone else like to comment also uh, i would uh, like to come on it and i would echo the part what mr ram has said i come from a tier 2 city and if you take the entire north karnataka belt it can actually count the number of optometrists that are there so the op- option was always there the demand is always there maybe in case of competition look for expansion still there is lot of lacunae in the entire system right now to have the optometrist uh, i think the in a tier 2 or tier 3 city thank you kunal i think it came out uh, you know well enough uh, in terms of audio i think um, uh, you know thank you so much i know you're from a place where it was very hard to connect uh, um and now before i go to the next question uh, there's a comment i think this is from lakshmi shinde you know ci she said that the ministry of health and family welfare as a platform which is very very good they have videos which are very good to see and learn if you need further information please do contact lakshmi at oci and she also says iacl has got a whole range of other online tools so please yeah i mean i think everyone knows so ci so please be in 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 touch uh, on on that uh now the next question is i think already kunal touched a bit in terms of you know how um the uh, optical outlets deal with it but i was just wondering from a hospital perspective is it going to change the way you do that because you probably can't limit patients you know as much as as what an outlet could do so maybe i think either vishwanath or kk or you know both could could comment on it yeah um as you rightly said see uh, crowding is one thing that uh, you know uh, you know in the hospitals that all of us know that people will throng once the lockdown is over so we are well aware about it and we are uh, you know um, uh, taking enough steps to you know take care of the crowding one thing that uh, you know what we are planning to do is to um, segregate things in a staggered manner uh, in the sense that one attendant per one uh, patient uh, so that is how we wanted to you know really start with also you know when we uh, uh, as i said some of the general guidelines like social distancing or uh, crowding and uh, you know like some of the um, guidelines like uh, to disinfect things immediately after every use i think when we uh, follow all these uh, you know norms uh, in fact we should use this uh, covid crisis to uh, get used to these uh, you know practices which we have forgotten in the in in, uh, not in the near uh, in the uh, past so uh, all these things i feel we need to get used to these uh, new norm yeah, over to you yeah Th- thank you vishwanath now this next question i think predominantly maybe kk could answer since monica had to go to the other meeting um in terms of education you know with all this new online tools that are coming in is this going to help the future of optometry in india in terms of more students being able to join and benefit and all uh, i mean would it have a long term change in terms of how optometry training happens okay i think uh, as we all know uh, optometry is an applied science so. Uh, that means when you ask the question whether 
the virtual learning will be a solution for optometry in terms of uh, inculcating the knowledge, yes. In terms of inculcating the analytical ability, yes. But in terms of inculcating the skills, I feel as of now, uh, we ventured into understanding this few years back on how to see whether the skill transfer through the virtual learning is possible, at least the basic skill. Uh, thanks to Jyoti Palaji, he did that as part of his master's work long back. In fact, it was um, a challenging one. The results showed uh, because it is under the uh, no research, uh, uh, no protocol, it was uh, good enough in inculcating this, uh, no, all the skill. But is it possible for to inculcate that in an undergraduate effectively with a present, uh, no, uh, no post present infrastructure? I don't see that as a possibility, but definitely yes. Now I'm just looking at uh, what UGC is giving recommendation for at least until this COVID times. So they are envisaging up to probably this uh, following semester, maybe up to January, February, they are looking at as a uh, part of the thing. They, they say today for as a recommendation, 75% uh, can be face to face. That means all of our skill training, uh, no clinical training can happen and 25% use slight, slowly incorporated the um, no virtual learning. I think this is a simple recommendation to start with most of the uh, institutions, uh, which is possible. Uh, but for the institution already has ventured into can move towards the 50-50. In fact, one of the stronger recommendation I give for benefit of optometry, if you realize optometry is more of applied science, is it possible for us to have at least to do towards the applied courses, towards the third years and probably part of the second year. If you have predominantly virtual learning art and assessment also, give more time for debates, discussion and skill transfer and analytical uh, part of it, case discussion and that stuff, so that you'll have more of time and probably this is a great opportunity. I see COVID has given us a great opportunity to see the transformation in pedagogy itself which will be a meaningful transformation towards equipping people who have uh, no less of um, no opportunity to listen to all stalwarts and respecting. So we can pull in different institutions if you through the association can pull in their you know, expertise and see that instead of 30 people or 60 people sitting into the classroom, we can have you no know, thousands of people throughout the country can watch through that uh, thing and respect you skill component alone with a demonstration can be you know, practiced at their respective place. To a large extent, we can bring in uniformity through this exercise. Uh, probably I see this a huge opportunity for institution. Um, you, it, they are going to have inflow of people into healthcare. I'm seeing that it because people will like to see that they could be part of this whole story of solving the problems. Um, I feel it is going to be a great opportunity waiting for institution to take more students. Thank you very much, KK. I think we are getting very close to the end of the session. So I'm going to actually leave it open for the panelists to say any closing words. I've got a whole range of other questions, but I, I guess we can't uh, you know, answer all the questions. But before I pass it to the panelists, just a very quick announcement. So tomorrow, at 1 p.m., India Vision Institute, um, along with SLR, is going to have a quiz contest. It's called the IVA SLR Optometry Wizard of the Year. The four finalists are Preetha Ramprasad, Associate Professor at Vasan Institute, Mr. Vedalingam Ganeshan, Clinical Optometrist uh, from Doha, Mr. Saravanan, Clinical Optometrist at Achuta Eye Care Road, and Mr. Jogendra Rathor, who's a Clinical Optometrist at Clear Vision Eye Hospital in Ahmedabad. So please uh, log in. There are attractive prices for those four participants, but there is also very attractive prices for the audience. There's a bunch of questions that's going to be thrown at the audience. So if you can, that's from one o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Now for the closing um, comments, I'll, I, I can probably suggest each person can speak for 30 seconds or something. If you want to you know, say something to close. You want to start with maybe Sandeep? Uh, uh, thanks, Vinod. I mean, uh, based on all of it that we are learning, we're listening to, uh, it's very clear that uh, 
as much as we see this as a, a disaster or a unforeseen epidemic it also brings with it a lot of opportunities opportunities which are not just relevant in this time it is relevant uh, for the future as it comes we've always been talking about using more technology for trainings using more technology for interventions increasing scope of services to reach out to unreached communities and this kind of lockdown has made it, uh, it it's almost artificially created that situation that we need to now get out of our comfort zones and start doing uh, stuff that is going to be quite uh, path breaking for the future of public health uh, overall not just uh, in optometry or eye sciences so uh, the only message for me is to to look at it as an opportunity uh, and see how the learnings from this period we can scale it up to uh, to future and and start seeing what are the linkages with the problems that we were facing earlier before all this happened can we find some of those solutions and can those solutions be long lasting even beyond this epidemic thank you uh, ram it's ram you got you got yeah, unmute yeah yeah, yeah I'm so I, I i guess uh, we've got a huge opportunity now within the industry because covid has made everyone uh, to play as you say in tennis love all you know when we start off it's all going to be starting from first set love all so i think now is optical industry the optometry fraternity the ophthalmology all of us have to come together i think we have got uh, to, uh, to in india we have got too many things too many place having all for a good cause but i think somewhere we, there should be a good platform that where it's be unified force can really make india much stronger in the in the zika sector because uh, it will be seen also well in the international side and uh, so this is giving us an opportunity to be uh, i think a lot of efforts have been made in that direction it's a uh, it's a good way to start off and uh, and one good positive aspect also is that uh, until now there's only 1% of the gdp has come as a stimulus so i guess that uh, probably as you go along there'll be more uh, percentage because in the last 2008 there was about 4% of the gdp was given a stimulus so i think the good good things are going to happen in the future thank you ram uh, vivek vivek you're on mute yeah i'd just like to share uh, two key words there's going to be democratization of the entire healthcare system uh, which would have taken us another 20 or 30 years to achieve is going to happen in a very short period of time thank you thank you vivek that was very good um uh, kk just uh, I, i want to reinforce for students who are there uh, ugc has given the guideline clear cut guideline as to the mode of um, teaching mode of uh, examination especially for this uh, 2019 20 and 2020 and 2020 21 also i think a lot of instructions have been given uh, i think uh, you people should go through it so that you know what are the benefits that you are going to get through this uh, for example one of the benefit i want to say they they are willing to take the internal marks as the final mark if you do if you uh, have um no exams can't can't can be conducted exams and we can do it but they also allow online examination instead of 3 hours the final examination can be 2 hours all those nitty gritty details have given maybe your university or the school can look into it and get the detail and um, central government especially ugc has uh, opened up swayam and swayam prabha are the two online materials available for all of you to go through it in details about the uh, thing and government also allow usage of google classroom hangouts cisco webex youtube streaming all those thing except uh, the one which has not been uh, told by the mhrd long back so as all these things have been extremely uh, in a positive situation you be prepared yourself i know youngsters are all into virtual learning then as we have to cope up much with you and faculty especially i think you have to put lot of effort to align with uh, especially in the assessment technique will be a challenge more than teaching uh, probably those training need to be done and government itself has taken some initiative to train faculty on all this ict thing so uh, it is not going to be for next one year uh, not going to be five days a work it's going to be six days a work thank you thank you and dr vishnath 
Yeah, as Kiki said, uh, there's going to be a lot of guidelines uh, regarding each of the uh, practices are going to be made uh, available. And few of the guidelines have been discussed here too. But what I would suggest all of them to use uh, this COVID crisis to go through it, get to use to some of the forgotten or compromised practices. And, uh, you know, I would uh, suggest and urge people to follow those meticulously and uh, don't leave it in between. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I have one, one point. Sorry, Vinod. No. I, I want to reiterate because I know many of the practitioners in India use the non-contact uh, tonometer, which is a puff uh, thing. That means it generates aerosol, which is against usage during this COVID era. So uh, my only request is, as part of the guideline, uh, please don't use NCT at least for next six to eight months until you now these things get settled. You will be transmitting it. Thank you. Thanks, KK. Kunal, Kunal, you're on. You're on mute. Yeah. So COVID-19 has changed the way uh, that we work today. It has also changed the way we think, and changed the way a customer buys. So it would be very important to understand the customer need. And in case you understand the need and you can have a proactive approach, you can actually take the market. You don't have to worry about the revenue and the profit. Even if you're taking businesses in China, they are showing that the economic recovery is far higher than most predictions. With this in mind, it is necessary to prepare now in order to best benefit in the future. Thank you very much, Kunal. Thank you very much, panelists, for your time and for sharing in your, uh, in your knowledge. Uh, I hope all those who joined uh, you know, benefited from it. Uh, we are planning on doing a whole range of sessions on different aspects, um, you know, such as this please do uh, send us an email on ivi at indiavisioninstitute.org or just put a like on Facebook because we normally promote it quite solidly through Facebook. Thank you again. Stay safe and um, good afternoon. Thank you.